here to talk about uh, a history how to upgrade a big Rails application to Rails 5. This is a history how Shopify launched the Rails 5 upgrade to production. So first I'm going to introduce myself. I am Rafael França. You can find me at Twitter or GitHub as Rafael Franca. I'm a member of the Rails Core team and I work for Shopify as a production engineer. You may know me more because every single repository of the Rails organization you enter, you're going to see this as the last commit. So I'm also the self-proclaimed Rails maintainer because I usually do all the releases. So this is like the history how Shopify released Rails 5 to production, but why look at Shopify? Because why Shopify is so special in, in that you have to look on it? Because Shopify started around the same time as Rails. So the first initial commit of Shopify code base was in 2004, even prior to the first stable release of Rails. So Shopify started at 2004, Rails 1.0 was only released in 2005. And also this application was never rewritten, so we are also still using the same application that started 13 years ago. So this is a timeline comparison between Rails and the Shopify code base. So we can see that Shopify followed the Rails versions really closely. In, in this example, like in, in Rails 2.0, Shopify upgraded to 2.0 just after the release. The same case happens with the Rails 3.0, was just close to the release. But for the Rails 3.2, we took a little more time to upgrade. Like it's almost one year after that, we upgraded to Rails 3.2. And we also skipped Rails 2.1 because it was too much work in that application. So this is when we actually re released the Rails 3.2. And for the case of the Rails 5, like Rails 5 was released in June of 2016, and we started the upgrade of the Rails 5.0 right after the Rails 4.2 was merged to, to Shopify, and we only finished it in 2000, 2017. It was almost like it was more than one year after we started to upgrade Shopify to Rails 5.0 that we could actually deploy it to production. Also, Shopify is a big application. When I say big, it's really big. Maybe it's the biggest Rails application that you have in production right now. We have more than 374 lines of code. It's just counting lines inside the app and lib folder. It's excluding any kind of test code. We have more than 100,000 lines at our, our models, and we have more than 2,000 classes inside the mod directories. And also we have a, a lot of code in the controllers directory. And our test coverage is good to, application has this size, right? We have 1.3 lines of test for each line of code. And Shopify is also in the last Rails versions. If you don't consider that Rails 5.1 is probably going to be released today. So how was, how do you upgrade the application to Rails 5? Well, it's simple you create a new branch, you make all the changes necessary <laughs> to upgrade to Rails 5, you measure it, I don't know what's happened later, and you profit. It's simple. 
Well, that's not our case. Shopify is a really massive beast. We have some hundreds of developers working every single day in the same code base. Creating a branch to upgrade the Rails version and keep it up to date is hard because of all the conflicts that may happen because someone changed something or people could be introducing new bugs every single commit. We need a different way to, to use and test the same code base with two different versions of chains. So we come up with a strategy to make the application possible to work with two versions of Rails. Dual booting, in our case, was the best solution because it allowed us to run the same code division with two different versions of the framework in both tests and development or even production. The solution is not hard to implement. You create two different gen files, the gen file.next and the normal gen file. You use a environment variable that is already a feature of the bundler to install the gens. And this works just fine. It is the recommended way by the bundler team to do this. But in a big application, two G files are also really hard to maintain since people could upgrade one and forget to upgrade the another one. And also the version that is used in one gen file should be the same as the version in the another gen file. So to solve this problem, we did something that I'm not proud of. We did a hack to share the same gen file. Uh, this is the beginning of our gen file right now. It's a huge mock patch inside the bundle internals that I'm not proud of this code that I wrote. But forget about that and focus on what's important. We have some conditionals inside the origin file like this. If we pass an environment variable called Rails X, it's going to run with Rails 5. If not, it's going to run with Rails 5 too. And you could use this environment variable to install your chains or even start your Rails console, your Rails server. This approach is good because it's keep possible to do dual booting. It, it also addresses the issues in the previous approach, like having two gen files because you don't have the decides of forgetting to update the another gen file. Of course, the decides of this is having to do a mock and patch in bundle. So I, I try to come up with a better way. I never tested this in production yet, but you could use a, a feature in bundle called evolve gen file. So you have a gen file with real size, and let's say you have also a shared gen file, and you have another gen file with real size one, and you have the shared gen file with all the genes that you, you want to share. And the config slash boot, boot rb, you add that three lines of code that to change the gen files depending on the environment variable. The result of this is you still need to use that in the command line to install the genes, but to start the server, you only need to change the Rails X environment variable. So when I do the, the dual booting, it, it's now possible to run my code base with two different versions of Rails. So what we did, we created a parallel CI build that was running with Rails 4.2 and Rails 5. Given that that's now possible, I can now start to work on the upgrade itself. So what we did, we started the upgrade all our dependencies. It's important to always have dependencies working in both versions and because it's easy to test that behavior is correct. So what we did was really simple. We make sure that all the versions are, were using the same versions that work with both Rails 4.2 and Rails 5. And when it was not possible to have a version that worked with Rails 5, we contributed 
contribute back to the dependencies. Some dependencies takes a long time to upgrade to newer Rails versions, so this is a really an opportunity to give back to the community. I have uh, one example here. I had to upgrade the Gen Action Pack XML parser to support the Rails 5, and this was a good opportunity to also simplify the code of the, the dependency itself. Because in real side we had some architecture simplifications and that made the code of the plugins easier to write. So in this case, we had, this is the entire code of the shame. Like you have a bunch of lines of code that I don't want you to focus on. But after the real five upgrade, we could change the chain to be just that. It's a simple call that ca call hash from XML or return empty hash. So that, that was a good example how upgrading your Rails version can make your dependencies simpler. So after that, we after we upgraded all the dependencies, we started to fix all the tests because we had thousands of tests failing. So what we did was, for each broken test, we created a branch, we got the test, we fixed the test, and we deployed to production. It's as boring as you can imagine. But I have a, this is the list of the all pull requests that were created between the time we were upgraded to Rayosol in production. As you can see, it's huge. And there is nothing really fancy on this task. We just created a, a bunch of PRs and fixed all the things that were broken. Sometimes you can take days to fix one, to fix one single task, and sometimes one single code change can fix hundreds of the, the tests. Let's talk about our biggest challenges on this upgrade. The first one was the protected attribute genes. If you don't know what protected attribute was, let's say that you have a model users that have attributes as attributes name, password, and admin. By the way, if you know about this, this attribute API is actually working, so you can define your attributes like this if you want your Rails application. So let's say that you have this model and you have a user's controller in the admin ad space, namespace. So you find the user by ID, you update the attributes that come from the form, and you redirect it back to the root path. And in your form, you have Name and password and admin. If you, in Rails 4.2, actually in Rails 3, to that work, you, sh you need to add a new method called attribute accessible to tell Rails that those attributes are accessible through, through message And let's say that now your feature is changed and you want to give users uh, the possibility to update the old name and password. So you create another controller that does basically the same thing, but the form is different because you only want the users to be able to change the name and the password, but, but not the admin flag. What kind of problem does this cause? Well, something like this may happen. If you don't know, this was a hack in 2012 where a guy called Homakov could commit to Rails repository without having access to the repository itself. So how that guy made this happen? What he did was really simple. He created a new SSH key using his own SSH key in the DHH user. So GitHub did not have support, not support, but protection to this kind of attack in that time. So it was possible to a person add a new SSH key in the user's, any user account. And it was really simple. To mitigate this kind of problem, 
what you could do, you could add a new attribute accessible call to say that the admin flag is only allowed when you are doing the attribute assignment as an admin, and in your admin controller, you say that you want to predate the attribute as an admin. So that was in Rails 3.2, and in Rails 4, we changed the way that this, all this protection works with the stronger parameters. It brings the protection closer to the source of the input, in this case, the controller, so it's easy to you to remember to protect your data before sending it to the model. So how strong parameters works? It works similarly, but you have to filter all the parameters before send, send it to the update in the controller itself. So we started a huge task to remove all the attribute access accessible users in Shopify because real size would not support attribute accessible anymore. And we had more than 150 pull requests and three months of work to remove this feature from Shopify itself. In some cases, we were just simple as moving the attribute accessible calls to the controllers that are assignment attributes to that models, but in other case, we were found that maybe we were missing some kind of abstraction in the framework. So in some cases, like we had some massive forms with a lot of attributes, we actually created abstraction called form object using the drive validation chains to filter all the attributes before sending to the model. Another challenge that we had was controller tests. We had a lot of controller tests like this. Like we created a, a request to action, sending a title, and in this case, I empty hash as tags. And in Rails 2, when the request comes to controller, the tags, the text parameters were actually an empty array, but in Rails 5, the text parameters was not an empty array anymore. It was actually blank. So why this change of behavior between those two versions? So let's say that you have a code like this. Like, this is a valid code, but it's not as, as, as exciting what the actually happening in the browser. So you have the post, you do the request, you set the parameters, and you send the parameters to the controller. But in Rails 5, what we did was we actually encoded the parameters as the browser would be done. Like, you cannot send the empty array to uh, an application using the browser itself. That's invalid by definition of the encoder of parameters of the browser. So in that time, we had no way to fix this, this regression because there is no way to you to tell Rails to not encode the parameters as the browser because what we are trying to test is, is if it's possible to send this information as JSON to the application. We had to open a pull request in Rails itself to make it possible to set the content type with uh, as option in the controller test. What changes is now it's possible to you to pass uh, as options in the request itself, and both Rails 4.2 and Rails 5 is going to behave in the same way because now it's not encoded the parameters as a browser, but encoded the parameters as a JSON request. Speaking parameters, that was another thing that gave us a lot of troubles. Because since in Rails 5, actual parameters does not inherit for hash anymore, a lot of code that we were doing type checking with hash broke. So in Rails 5, we had parameters like this. In Rails 4, actually. In Rails 5, parameters are not inherent for hash anymore. This change was to improve security 
because man, in many places that are not just models are vulnerable for mesa assi assignment lags, like URL helpers, no active he record models like active uh, resource. And to avoid these problems, we made parameters to not inherit for hash. So what's happening in Rails 5 now is like you have a parameters with name Raphael. If you call parents.2h, you get an empty rash because you did not filter anything. If you call 2 and say for h, you get all the parameters. And if you do the filtering properly in call to h, you get what you filter it. So we had to fix a bunch of places that were relying on the behavior that parameters is a hash. So we had a lot of a bunch of code with this kind of checks, like if parameters is a hash, do something, and this will not happen anymore, work anymore. So what we did was to avoid that parameters enter in the model layer. So in the controller layer, we call the 2H model, or in some case, we leak the abstraction inside the models and do this is the type check use and parameters. In my opinion, there is, that is not an ideal solution. It's caused a lot of pain in our code base and it's also a pain in a lot of other code bases. So we need to think in a solution that would improve security but keep it being pleasant to work with. So I think six days ago, yeah, six days ago, I opened this pull request in Rails itself to improve the upgrade path of strong parameters. It's, the change is now, if you call 2H without filtering your parameters, you get a exception. This is good because usually that is exactly what you want. You don't want to send a filtering parameters inside your models or inside other parts of your application. If you call 2 and save H, of course you get all, all the information in the parameters. But if you call 2H, doing the filtering, you get what you get, you want. So in my opinion, this is going to help everyone to get uh, easier upgrades because we suffer a lot with this feature and it's also going to improve security. So how the road to production looks like in an application like this? Like we have Shopify running with both version of Rails we could make sure that all the tests are passing with both versions, but how to deploy that to, to production? It's not just like deploy to production the real side container and that's it. So what we did was we deployed to production in a, like, in a small pace, like a smaller set of, of production servers we're using the new version of Rails, and we had to write some compatibility layers. Because Shopify needed to run in both versions in productions, and there is no way to you to tell that one request is only going to hit one version of Rails. Let's say that your user is going to the checkout page, and as soon as you click in checkout, your request that was served by a Rails 2 application is going to be served by a Rails 5 application. So we need to make sure that there is no difference between two requests to different versions. So in the Rails 2 era, we had to do some monkey patches in the Rails itself to make it possible to work in both versions. In this case, we created the monkey patch to generate CSFR uh, tokens in Rails 1 that is compatible with Rails 4 too. The difference is that in Rails 5 now we try to create the same kind of compatibility layers inside the framework itself so you don't need to do that in your application too. So this is one of the examples in Rails 5 
we created a, a legacy EMO encoding to parameters because, like I said, parameter was hashes in Rails 2 and they are not hashes anymore in Rails 5, so we had to be able to read the EMOs, the encoded parameters in previous versions in the new versions. So we did what we call the gradual rollout that we deployed to production just a small percentage of the servers. This is the message of our bots deploying to production with 50% of the servers running in Rails 5. So what we did was we deployed to production, we find bugs in productions, we fix those bugs, we hold back to 0% of the new version, and we deploy later with the bug fixed again. We also did some benchmarks, so this is our bot responded to me to a, a profile of, of five seconds in one of the production machines. So it gives to us a uh, stack trace with all the methods that are mostly colored in the server in that period. So what we did was we profiled different servers to compare the results and see if there is no performance regression between the two versions. If performance regression is found, we reverse the deploy, we fix the regression in the framework, and we deploy again. So this was the time that I actually did the deploy to 100% of the servers. It was 7 p.m., almost 8 p.m. at night, the same at 22. So, was really brave to do that, but at least it worked. So after the, the deployed production, we had to start the cleanup because we end up with a lot of feature toggles inside the all code base checking if the Rails version is four or Rails version is five. We had to first remove all those conditionals, and we also had to remove all the deprecations. In in, in this project, a small team of four people working on it, it's not possible to a small team of four people remove all the deprecations that you have in the Shopify code base. So what we did, we need help from everyone in the company. Our first approach was to consider that printing deprecations while you're running tests locally were enough, but it turned out that people are really good at ignoring deprecations. So, we created a white list of test files that have deprecations and asked teams to remove all the deprecations of those test files that are part of the components. Like, and in the last, the last thing that that we do after we remove all the deprecations is upgrade the configuration to match the new defaults of Rails. And after that, we start the preparation of the new upgrades. This is, uh, uh, this kind of project never have end because Rails is always release a new version. So we are always trying to keep track of the Rails version. So for the future, what we want at Shopify is to avoid monkey patch at all costs. That means that Upgrades are easiest because we are only using features of Rails, and the only way to do that is to keep our number of dependencies smaller because as much as more dependencies you have, more likely to have monkey patch on the dependencies. We are going to keep the parallel side running the entire year, and. My goal is to keep it tracking of the Rails master mention forever. It means that Shopify would be running in the last version of Rails forever. And of course, things will breaking and it's not what you want to make everyone's concern. Everyone at the company should be concerned about keeping the application up to date.
We also want to think more about backwards compatibility inside the framework itself. It's it's part of the Shopify give back into community to be to pay me to work at the real framework to make it easier to everyone to upgrade this application. Because Shopify loves Rails and we want Rails to succeed and we want everyone to be able to use the latest versions of the Rails without any problem. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was, we have a white list for, of deprecations. If we configure the rails to raise in the deprecations inside that file, we yeah we use it, the rails deprecation behavior, but we have a special code that what does is it records all the deprecations, and if the deprecation don't match the list of recorded deprecations, it fails the test. So. And also, if there is no deprecation in that file anymore and you have recorded, it's also fail. So that we are planning to open source that code too. So maybe next month. So the question is, the recruiter said that there are ops and front-end developers at Shopify. If I am in the ops team, he has part of it. Like, we don't have the ops the kind of ops organization, we have what Google calls SRA and Facebook's called production engineering is kind of developers with ops background. And yeah, yes, I work in this team, so my job there is to make tools for everyone. So it's open source tools or any kind of production tools. More questions? I will be here if you have more questions you want to talk. Thank you.